tremendous program tonight, uh, probably one of our better ones. We have Mr. Doug Grant, K1DG, and he's got a, a, uh, a very interesting profile. He's been contesting for 50 years and DXing for 50 years. He decided, or after you know, 50 years of DXing and contesting, he decided to try his hand at something completely different. And that is Moon Bounce, or EME, Earth, Moon, Earth. And this evening's uh, discussion and presentation will uh, show us how that you know, most challenging activity uh, is achieved and, and how you can get started yourself. Uh, Doug was first licensed in 1967, and he's been active on HF continuously since then, mostly in contesting. He's won numerous HF contests and holds a few contest records from his own station and as members of multi-op teams in the U.S. and overseas. He is or has been a member of the ARRL Contest Advisory Committee, the CQ Worldwide Contest Committee, president of the Yankee Clipper Contest Club, a founder of the Worldwide Radio Operators Foundation, and a chair of the Dayton Hamvention Contest Forum. He's been a competitor in the WRTC seven times. And Doug, what is the WRTC? That's the uh, World Radio Sport Team Championship. It's uh, every four years, kind of like the Olympics of ham radio. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, because I, I didn't know what that was and didn't I discovered it too late to look it up real quick. And he's won gold, two, won gold and two bronze medals at that event. He's also the chairman of the uh, WRTC 2014 Organizing Committee in Boston and is a member of the CQ Contest Hall of Fame. Congratulations to you. That's great. Doug wrote the ARRL Amateur Radio Contesting for Beginners book and was the managing editor of CQ Amateur Radio Almanac. He dabbles in uh, chasing DX between contests and has worked all current DXCC entities and achieved DXCC on all bands from 160 through six meters. And he holds a five band worked all zones award and has a DXCC challenge score of over 2,600. I'm not sure how, how good that is, but I'm going to assume that that's over the top. <laughs> <laughs> He's built and maintains two radio stations, one at his home in New Hampshire and one primarily for contesting on a small main coastal island, which I'm sure is a rare, uh, uh, a rare grid square. <laughs> so good evening to you, Doug. Thank you very much for joining us with the Santa Clarita Amateur Radio Club. Okay. Here. Glad to be here. Um, now, last time I just last time I tried to do this, it crashed everything. So I'm going to try and share one of my uh, share my presentation screen, and with any luck, you'll be able to see my slides. Yes. Hey, it's working. Okay. Okay, everybody, please mute themselves. All right. There we go. I think. All right. I'm still seeing, uh, still seeing my video. I'm seeing your video and I'm seeing all that stuff up there. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, moon bounce, which is uh, something that uh, is the craziest thing I've ever done in ham radio. Um, I, I'm, uh, I'm seeing all you, uh, I'm seeing a few of us over there on the right side blocking the screen. Are you able to see the whole screen? Okay. Okay. So the first time I read about Moon Bounce was in the January 1967 issue of QST, which was even before I got my ham license by about six months. And I read in the VHF column that a guy in Australia worked a guy in New Jersey on two meters by bouncing signals off the moon. The guy in Australia was using 150 watts and a four high stack of rhombics on two meters. Um, and uh, the other guy was using a commercial 60 foot dish and 650 watts. And I thought about that and said, this is just crazy. It's, it's insanely cool. And someday I'm going to do that. But I'm not really a VHF. -er. Um, in, the, in those days, serious VHF guys had equipment that looked more like plumbing than, like, than radios. They had very fancy things like low noise amplifiers that were homebrew and transverters, whatever those are. And, 
crazy antennas, and that was that was just too much for me. Um, so I started out with some wires in the trees, and eventually graduated to beams. I did traffic handling on 80 meters, and eventually worked into uh, uh, doing contest and DX chasing on HF. So let's talk about some of the crazy antennas that people use on uh, two meter moon bounce. Um, on the left there, you can see I2FAK's array. That's 16, 19 element Yagis. And it's uh, rotatable uh, uh, around the compass and up and down so it can track the moon. Uh, W7GJ in Montana has uh, two EME systems you can see there. One is an array of 16, 17 element Yagis for two meters and four by nine on six meters. The one on the far right is the 50 foot dish antenna at HB9Q in Switzerland. They use that on two meters and 432. Um, and just to put things in perspective, most dish guys uh, use a little dipole or a patch feed as the driven element. Uh, HB9Q uses a four element Yagi as the driver for the dish. Um, so that's a, an outrageously big antenna and, and a big signal. This is the biggest of them all in uh, the amateur category, I think. Um, it's uh, at DL7 APV. That's 128 11 element Yagis for 432. It's got 33 dB of gain. And you can get, for perspective, you can see DL7 APV sitting um, in front of it on the part of the rotator mechanism. He, he scrounged that somewhere. It took him 10 years to build all the antennas and put the whole array together. And uh, he basically works everything on 432. Here's another big antenna that's been used on uh, EME for by hams. Um, it's the uh, <coughs> Arecibo Observatory 1,000 foot dish in uh, Puerto Rico. Um, sadly, it, uh, it uh, collapsed a few years ago. One of the, uh, the guy wires on one of the support towers for the feed system uh, came undone. Uh, the guy wire snapped, the support tower went down and the, uh, the, the big gondola up there that holds all the electronics and the antenna came crashing down and destroyed the dish. Um, before that happened though, they occasionally used it on 432 moon bounce. Um, in the 70 centimeter band, it's got 56 dB of gain, which is quite a bit. Uh, they were only transmitting with 35 watts and WD5AGO was doing a demonstration in his classroom and they had speaker copy signals using three foot long Yagis. So you get the idea that uh, that antenna had a lot of gain and they were putting out an enormous signal. Now at the other extreme, remember that guy with the 128 Yagi array? He worked a guy who was using a dipole on uh, 432 um, on uh, the, and the, the guy with the dipole was only running 60 Watts. On six meters, uh, W7GJ worked that station that you see in that picture with just a five element Kushcraft Yagi and about 300 Watts of power. So it doesn't really take a huge amount of, of juice uh, to make uh, contact with one of the big stations. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. <coughs> So moon bounce wasn't how I got started on two meters a few years ago. Um, I wanted to chase the Brendan trophy. Um, that's an award that's been offered for uh, several decades now and still hasn't been claimed for the first contact between North or South America and Europe without using the moon or a satellite. So it has to be done using terrestrial propagation. And I thought that uh, since I had a place in Maine, which is uh, pretty close to Europe from uh, certainly com uh, compared to Santa Clarita, um, uh, that uh, I had a shot at uh, getting the Brendan Trophy. And as I looked over what it was going to take, the station requirements are the same. You need a pretty good transmit power, a, a, a very good receiver, um, and the antenna is a little bit different, but I decided to use moon bounce sort of for practice um, since uh, all the equipment would be the same stuff. So let's talk about what it takes to do EME. The path loss from the earth to the moon and back is about 250 dB um, on two meters. Uh, what that means is the signal power that's coming back to earth from a station on earth uh, is one ten millionth of one billionth of one billionth of the transmitter power. Uh, in other words, not very much. Uh, it takes a lot of transmitter power, a lot of antenna gain and a sensitive receiver to detect signals at all 
And for a long time, CW was the mode of choice for EME. And it's really only possible for very well-equipped stations. At least that was the story before K1JT came along. Uh, Joe Taylor, K1JT, uh, decided that uh, being a Nobel Prize winning radio astronomer wasn't enough. Uh, he had to completely change ham radio. So he whipped up with the help of some friends, a, a suite of uh, uh, communication modes uh, called WSJT, weak signal Joe Taylor. And they include uh, the newer versions like FT8. Um, but there are several versions of the, of the, of the software, uh, several modes which are optimized for the communications path between here and the moon and back, uh, which is very, very weak signals. Um, so long transmission times and a lot of signal processing. Um, using WSJT, if you have a two meter SSB transceiver with hundred watts of output and what I would call a good antenna, uh, nine elements is about enough, um, more is better. If you have a, sh and you have to have a short low loss feed line, um, and a PC with the WSJTX software and a sound card, that's everything you need to be able to make at least a few contacts on moon bounce using the WSJT software. Um, now the operator requirements are patience. It, uh, you probably won't be successful the first time you try, you'll make a lot of mistakes, but when you finally get a see a signal coming back from the moon and then have a two way contact, it's a complete thrill, I have to say. So some of you have probably done FT8 on HF and comparing FT8 with the, uh, the moon bounce uh, signal modes. Um, on FT8, the signal is about 50 Hertz wide. Uh, you transmit for 15 seconds. There are eight tones used in signaling and the typical signal range of received signals is from plus 10 to minus 24. On JT65, the signal bandwidth is about 200 Hertz. The sequence period is about a minute, is a full minute. There are 65 tones instead of just eight. And the range of signals you can detect is from minus 10 to minus 30 uh, dB of SNR. And on the new Q65A mode, um, you can see the parameters there. It gives a, a few more dB of sensitivity and you can pick up uh, weaker signals that way. Uh, so here's a comparison of what the waterfall displays look like. Um, on FT8, in a voice bandwidth channel, uh, you can fit about 30 stations in, the, in that picture. That's, uh, that's how many there are there. In JT65, in one voice channel, there's usually one signal. And if you look very carefully in the, uh, the waterfall display on the bottom right, you can see that there's one very thin line, and that's a trace of a signal from G4TRA. Now remember that call sign, G4TRA. I'm gonna talk about him in a little while. Um, in a little bit different context, but you can see on the, on the left side, uh, that's an older version of WSJT running, but you can see the QSO that I had uh, uh, with uh, G4TRA calling me. Um, and uh, the red line shows his signal um, popping up out of the noise uh, down there. Here's what a loud JT65B signal looks like. Um, there's a sync tone, at about 1200 and something Hertz, 1270. Uh, in this case, uh, the signal has a little bit of Doppler shift, so it's a little bit off. And uh, you can also see all the tones that are being transmitted um, over to the, uh, going off to the right, which is higher in frequency. And if you hear a loud signal, it sounds like bagpipes, uh, one signal at a time, one tone, and uh, they're just sort of weird sounding modulation, randomly skipping through the frequencies. When a de-expedition goes out, uh, there are a lot of stations that can be calling. Uh, this is what the waterfall display looked like when there were about 15 stations all calling VP2 EMB, which was a few years ago, a moon bounce de-expedition uh, to the island of Anguilla. So my first moon mouse contact, I was up, at, uh, up in Maine on the island and I was looking around for some sporadic E on six meters, but there wasn't anything happening. And uh, I had the six meter chat room up in a window on, their, on the uh, computer. And W7GJ said he was uh, gonna be calling CQ on 50.190. So I dialed receiver there, plugged a headphone output into the PC, fire up the WSJT program. Um, the antenna that I have up there at the time was a step IR 
with uh, six meter elements also. Uh, so it was the equivalent of a six element beam. And I pointed it generally towards the setting moon. And I'm doing something else in the shack and out of the corner of my eye, I see something pop up on the screen and it's CQ from W7GJ and DN27 in Montana. And I look at the screen and it says that there's a 2.4 second DT, that's a differential in time. Uh, so that's how long it takes for a signal to go to the moon and back. So sure, that was a signal off the moon. It wasn't sporadic E. And uh, I got all excited that I could copy them. Uh, the next day, I connected the PC output to the radio microphone input without any fancy interface. Um, and uh, around the same time, a little bit later, W7GJ was there again, and I worked them on the, on the first call. So that was six meter moon bounce. So if you want to start getting start on moon bounce, whichever band you have the best the best antenna for in the best station, that's the best band for you to start on. There's activity on all bands from 50 megahertz up to and beyond 10 gigahertz. Now on six meters, moon bounce antennas are pretty big. So there's a limited pool of big stations that are potential QSO partners. Um, uh, as I mentioned, the, my first contact was on six meter moon bounce. W7GJ is always welcome, uh, welcoming for uh, new people who wanna try. And if you have uh, um, five or six element antenna that you can point towards the moon, doesn't have to point up at the moon, you can work at a moon rise or moon set. Um, and uh, a few hundred watts, you can probably work W7GJ. Uh, for 1296 and up, that requires a fair amount of technical skill and a dish antenna. Um, unless you've done a lot of work on those bands, I wouldn't recommend the, uh, above 1296 as a starting point. But two meters, 432 and 1296 have a lot of activity. The, the antennas are reasonably sized, equipment is readily available, and you probably already have something suitable. So pick the band that you have the best setup for and start, and start working there. So how to do it? Uh, you need to get the station ready. Make sure you have a clear shot at the moon. You know, if there's a big, if there's a uh, giant skyscraper near you or uh, a hill that blocks the moon, uh, that's going to be a little bit of a problem. Uh, you should test your receiver and antenna using uh, uh, beacons that are as far from you that you can actually hear. Make sure your rotator is calibrated. Make sure your receiver is hearing signals that are far away. Um, then pick a day when moon bounce conditions are good. Uh, be there at moonrise or moonset if you can't elevate your antenna. And there's a website, livecq.eu, which uh, allows you to see stations that are being heard by uh, other stations and uh, find the big guys that may be active. Those are going to be your best targets. Now, I mentioned good moon conditions. What the heck am I talking about? Well, it turns out <clears throat> the moon's orbit is not exactly round. And it's not exactly, it doesn't, the moon doesn't go around the earth right at the equator. The moon's orbit is slightly elliptical and it's tilted relative to the earth. Now the variation in distance from the earth results in about a two dB difference in path loss. So conditions are predictably better when the moon is a little bit closer. That's two dB that you get for free. The moonrise azimuth and maximum elevation vary throughout the month. Um, and conditions are particularly bad when the moon is in the same direction as the sun or the Milky Way or a few of the other constellations because they're big noise sources. And that can be a problem for big stations trying to hear little stations. Now you get something for free right at moonrise or moonset. Uh, sort of like uh, if you think about how Yagis work or any antenna over ground, um, there's uh, your, your Skywave signal has uh, uh, maximum and minimum uh, no uh, loops and, and or uh, great uh, lobes and nulls in the vertical takeoff pattern uh, based on the interaction with the ground. And at moonrise and moonset at the right angles, you get about 6 dB of what we call ground gain. And that helps a lot. Um, in fact, uh, when I was uh, trying to work W7GJ from my new house uh, here in New Hampshire, when I first put up my six meter beam, I modeled what the antenna pattern look, should look like. You know, I have pretty flat ground in the direction of moonset. And um, uh, my, uh, my antenna modeling said that I had a, uh, one lobe at about 20 degrees and another bigger lobe at about 10 degrees. So I had a SCED set up with W7GJ 
I had my antenna pointed the right direction at the moon. And as the moon got to about 20 degrees, I saw him calling CQ for a few cycles, but he didn't hear me. And I waited a little while. And when the moon got to about 10 degrees, I saw his signal come way up and he heard me and it was an easy contact. So um, that uh, ground gain really helps a lot. There's another website here, uh, MMM on VHF. That stands for Make More Miles on VHF. Uh, it's run by some guys in Germany and it shows days of good and bad conditions. And most of the big EME station operators focus their time on the good days because that's when they're gonna have the best chance of working small stations. Here's what the graph looks like of uh, uh, conditions on moon bounce on that uh, make more miles on VHF website. The uh, curve that really matters is the red one. And you can see that there's a big peak at what looks like uh, that was in March of 2021. March 6th and 7th looks like there was a huge amount of degradation. Uh, that's what the red line is tracking. Uh, so those would be particularly bad days to try and work, uh, work EME. Uh, conditions would not be as good. And the big stations won't be there because uh, uh, they'll be uh, experiencing too much noise and uh, that'll block them from working the small stations. So the days when that curve is closest to the bottom, um, is uh, when conditions are gonna be the best. Now, there are some strange things about moon bounce propagation also that you don't see on HF or on uh, ground wave VHF. Uh, Doppler shift, which uh, you learned about in physics a long time ago, and uh, it's sort of like the effect when you hear a, uh, a train go by, you hear the audio signal of the train, it goes So the, the uh, frequency you hear gets a little bit louder as uh, higher in frequency, higher in pitch as the train is getting closer to you, and then it goes lower as the train moves away. Um, same thing happens on moon bounce. When you bounce a signal off the, a moving object, particularly the moon, um, at moon rise, signals appear about 300 hertz higher because the moon is coming towards you and 300 hertz lower uh, when the moon is going down. And you can watch this if you uh, stay on for a whole day doing moon bounce, uh, you'll see signals um, uh, start out at uh, uh, higher in frequency and they'll work lower and lower and lower in frequency over time. There's another thing that happens, which is polarization shift. Uh, there are two things that, ca that, are, that cause polarization shift. One is geometric and that's pretty predictable. And then there's another one caused by what's called Faraday rotation as the signal goes through the earth's magnetic field. And uh, that's very frustrating. Um, the, uh, the effect is that um, guys, the two guys using horizontally polarized antennas might not hear each other. Uh, if one is using horizontal and one is using vertical, they will hear each other. Um, and it, it can be maddening. And uh, the magnetic field changes um, with time and it varies anywhere from over a few minutes to a few hours. So sometimes you just have to wait and wait and wait for the Faraday rotation to line up perfectly. And then you, uh, you can get a contact Sometimes you see a signal and then it fades away and comes back a few minutes later. Um, so remember the part I said that the operator needs to have a lot of patience to do EME? That's one reason. Now the spatial polarization shift, that's the easy part. If you look at the, the diagram there, which is not even close to scale, if a guy in uh, sort of looking straight at the moon um, from the, the, the center of the earth where the moon was directly overhead is transmitting a horizontal polarized signal, it bounces off the moon and at station B, sort of on the edge of where the earth is, uh, that signal will arrive vertically polarized. Um, and if someone if someone who's not all the way on the other side of the, uh, of the earth's uh, uh, the globe from, uh, from station A, uh, somewhere in the middle, uh, he might see the signal 45 degrees, except that if there's Faraday rotation, um, any of that can change. <clears throat> so one-way skip is a real thing on EME. Um, there can be situations where the other guy hears you great and you can't hear him at all. And you just have to wait until the signals rotate. So for target practice, uh, once you've got your station working and you wanna see if you can actually hear a signal off the moon, there's a, uh, a very conveniently placed uh, radar built by the French government. It's called Graves which is an acronym for Grand Réseau 
adapté something 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 in French, and basically it's uh, tracking satellites and space junk, and it's a uh, uh, it, it operates just outside the two meter ham band and it's on 24 7 365 so it's very easy to see um, it operates on 143 050 they have a very big antenna array that's the top picture there um, it's uh, in three sectors scanning around the sky when the moon is between 15 and 45 degrees of elevation in france the echoes from the uh, from their moon signal um, are very easy to see they have a separate receiving site, which is in the uh, lower picture there. Um, it's uh, you know, quite a distance away from the transmitting site. But um, it's, it's, it's very interesting to be sitting uh, here with the antenna pointed where the moon is going to come up and listening on that frequency. And as the moon comes up, the signal pops out of the noise and uh, um, is uh, visible for as long as you want to be there. So. The thing to do once you get uh, when, once you've discovered that your station is working, you can hear the Graves radar. Um, you can start listening for the big amateur stations, um, like FT8 signals are reported in DB. And if you look on the Live CQ website, which is kind of like the, the CW skimmer that uh, is used on HF, except it's for moon bounce, um, look for signals that are between minus ten and minus twenty dB. Those are the big guns. If you can see them and decode them. Uh, get on one of the chat rooms um, and ask them for a sked, and uh, they'll they'll almost always accommodate you. Um, and uh, most contacts are arranged on these uh, moonbounce chat rooms. Uh, there are separate rooms set up for uh, two meters and four thirty-two. Here's what that live CQ website looks like. Um, in this case, I've got it set up to look for the last twenty-five spots on two meters, and uh, you can see that. Uh, um, there are signals being reported. Uh, S52 OT is being seen by a couple of spotters, and he's got a pretty good signal at minus 23, minus 24. UT9UR, um, about a third of the way down the page, um, is uh, being reported at minus 15. That's a pretty big signal, and he'd be pretty easy to work. Um, but you can see that there are signals being seen there anywhere from minus, uh, minus 15 down to what, minus 27. Um, and some of the uh, signal reports are a factor of uh, the receiving station's capabilities, and some are um, determined by the transmitting station's capabilities. But that's uh, where you can see uh, po potential targets, and you can try tuning them in and see if you can hear them. And if you can hear them, then ask them for a schedule. So unlike a FT8 on HF, the JT65B mode uses uh, what are called shorthand signal reports, which um, allow you to uh, uh, send a standard report and uh, actually see it easily on the waterfall display. The standard report in moon bounce, this is a carryover from the old CW days, the standard report is O or O, 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 and the response is R, O, R meaning Roger, I saw your O and I'm sending O back. And then the next exchange is R, 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 which means I have received everything from you, contact is now complete. The O, by the way, comes from the early days of moon bounce. They had what they call the TMO signal report system. T was, I think I hear you. M was, um, I heard one call sign. And O was, I heard both call signs, uh, yours and mine. So we can make a contact here. Um, you enable those in WSJTX by turning on the VHF, UHF microwave features and clicking the shorthand box. Um, Set the VFO to an exact kilohertz frequency like 144.116.00. Set your transmit frequency at 1270. Receive tolerance to 500 hertz. Uh, if you're using the Q65A mode, uh, it, the uh, transmit frequency that's normally used here is 1500 hertz, and you're off to the races. So here's what a contact looks like using uh, WSJTX and uh, the uh, JT65B mode. Uh, this is a contact between RX1AS and uh, IK1WLV. Um, and what it looked like on the waterfall display is what you see over on the, uh, uh, on the right side. Uh, the bottom where you see um, a so it's kind of an almost solid line with a bunch of speckles off to the right, uh, that's uh, uh, IK4WLV calling RX1AS. 
The next one up is RX1AS answering him and giving the report OOO. And then they switch to shorthand mode and IK4WLV sends RO, which is those two uh, dashed lines. And then RX1AS responds with RRR, which is also two lines, but they're spaced a little bit further apart. So even if you can't hear it or decode it, you can see it on the screen. So when I started on Moon Bounce, again, remember I wasn't really planning on doing Moon Bounce for a long time. This was just practice. And I scrounged some uh, very old uh, 13 element Kushcraft Yagis. Actually, I asked a friend of mine uh, uh, who had a bunch of them. Um, I told him I was gonna try doing uh, two meter weak signal stuff. And um, he said, well, you know, do you want a beam? I said, yeah, sure. He said, Tell you what, I'll give you four. So he gave me four of these Kushcraft 13 element Yagis. I built an H frame. I had a 15 foot surplus military mass to put it on. Um, one good thing about moon bounce is you don't need the antenna up very high because the moon is mostly up in the air. So you don't need a high tower. You, you have to just be able to point the antenna up. Um, I scrounged one of these uh, sur surplus TV transmitter boards that was modified for two meters and um, a uh, surplus compact uh, power supply, 50 volts at 57 amps to run it. Um, I had a used TS590 and a used Dominus microwave converter, a preamp. I bought a used rotator. I didn't put a lot of money into this uh, first rain, uh, first attempt at doing EME, but I made a lot of contacts with it. And uh, as I started to experience the frustration of Faraday rotation, where you know a guy would be transmitting horizontal and I would be listening horizontal and couldn't hear him. I decided I needed to get uh, antennas that were switchable from horizontal to vertical. So I replaced the Kushcraft Yagis with four Innova antennas, uh, uh, Yagis, which were nine elements horizontal, nine elements vertical each, and four of those. Um, the uh, transver transverter I had was an older one and it drifted a little bit. So I uh, fixed that up by modifying it to have a GPS disciplined oscillator I added some more fans and cooling to the Larkhan amplifier. And uh, over the course of uh, the first year or so, I blew up several preamps, uh, mostly out of, of my own mistakes. I found out that the end connectors you get at the flea markets are not really good for a kilowatt on two meters. Um, I also had a Daiwa watt meter that was specified from 1.8 to 144 megahertz and spec for 1.5 kilowatts. I found out it wouldn't do both 144 megahertz and one and a half kilowatts at the same time. Um, so that burned up. Um, I've been through a few rotators um, and uh, the solid state amplifier board, I, I blew that up routinely um, uh, with multiple FETs having to be replaced and uh, uh, capacitors and low pass filters and all that. Um, and after using it for about uh, four or five years up in my main station, I brought it down to New Hampshire so I could use it year round. And uh, that led me to even more um, evolution. Um, I decided I needed uh, the, the radio plus transverter plus all the switching for all that was too much. So I picked up a used TS2000 transceiver, which is perfectly adequate. It, uh, it's stable enough. Um, I picked up an 887 ampl 8877 amplifier that actually was owned once by K1JT. So I figure the uh, the amplifier knew the way to the moon and back. Um, so that would be a pretty good one. He actually used that amplifier to debug a lot of the software. I got a sequencer from W6PQL, a little kit, very inexpensive. That controls uh, 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 the sequencer is important to, to turn off the preamp before you go into transmit mode. Um, that handles everything in the right order so you don't blow anything up. Um, on the receive side, I added a gas fed preamp up on the tower with a little box with some relays in it. Uh, I upgraded the antenna system from four uh, cross polarized nine element Yagis to four cross polarized 14 element Yagis. They're spaced uh, uh, 16 feet apart, horizontal and vertical. Uh, the transmit feed line is 7 8 inch heliax. I use uh, a DX engineering uh, LMR 400 equivalent on receive because uh, um, I can tolerate a little bit more loss with the uh, gas fed preamp up there. And there's a few other tricks I can do. And I had to upgrade the rotator uh, to some pretty heavy duty stuff and green heron controllers. 
And uh, one day I was out in the backyard and I noticed that the moon was, uh, was up and the antenna was pointed towards it. And uh, so I took the obligatory picture of my uh, four Yaggies uh, pointed at the moon. So what have I done so far on EME? I have 600 initials, so that's uh, uh, individual stations that I've contacted on, uh, on the digital modes. Um, and I've actually made four contacts on CW. Uh, so I have great respect for the guys uh, who have done CW um, over the years. Um, uh, there's guys who've made DXCC working uh, CW um, on uh, moon bounce. That's pretty hard. Um, I have 77 countries. I worked 38 states from Maine before I shut down from there and moved to New Hampshire. And I've got 42 states from here. Um, and uh, the two stations are far enough apart that I can't combine them. Uh, otherwise I would have 48. Um, and uh, the smallest station I've been able to work was running a nine element Yagi at 400 Watts. And the uh, smallest station I was able to copy uh, was running nine elements on hundred Watts. I decoded them a couple of times, but he couldn't hear me. So uh, we didn't actually make contact. And if I play this clip, hopefully this will, I think the audio is also shared. Let me try and play this audio clip. Um, and uh, there's a CW signal here, and uh, let's see if you can copy it. Wait a minute. Okay, that, I don't know how well that came through, um, but uh, at your convenience, you can uh, download the presentation and listen to it and see if you can copy it. There's a, uh, there are two call signs being sent there and I'll give you a hint, one of them is mine. Um, but uh, the other one is, uh, oops, there we go. So um, I've worked some cool DX on Moonbounce <clears throat> and uh, I just have a few samples of uh, cards that I got from uh, stations that I work. I figure uh, the exotic DX, uh, anything, any call sign that starts with a number is pretty exotic and pretty cool. So here's some number call signs that I've worked. Uh, a couple of them were de-expeditions and some of them are fixed stations. Um, and uh, uh, 4Z5CP is uh, in downtown Tel Aviv and uh, has a lot of noise, but uh, he manages to work a few guys. All the continents are pretty easy to get to. Um, what's what's uh, sort of interesting about moon bounce is that everybody's the same distance away, really. Um, a station in Africa or Asia is about a half million miles away and a station that's uh, um, in the next town over is a half million miles away. Um, so uh, everybody, is, everybody is big DX. Um, but some of the exotic contacts are a little bit harder when you don't have a lot of uh, overlap time on moon bounce um, when, uh, when you can both see the moon. Um, but you can see a few uh, pretty cool countries that I work there. Um, and uh, the, uh, the stations in the former Soviet Union are very active. I've worked quite a few. Um, RX-1AS was a very big gun. He unfortunately is a silent key as of about uh, two or three weeks ago. And it was uh, very sad because uh, um, you know, very sudden and unexpected. And he had a very big signal and a great receiver. He was a lot of stations... Uh, first QSO on moon bounce. Um, you can see some of the other stuff uh, that I've worked. Uh, out there on the West Coast, K6MYC is uh, one of the uh, the godfathers of moon bounce. Uh, he's, he's been very active himself and uh, has supplied a lot of antennas and rotators and other equipment that uh, people have used on moon bounce. Now, G4TRA there, <clears throat> I wanted to mention him specifically. Uh, way back at the beginning, I showed you what his signal trace looks like. Um, he runs about 400 watts and he has a single Yagi and doesn't have elevation capability. So he can only work people during his moonrise and moonset, which means uh, for uh, maybe a half an hour uh, a day for uh, um, a, few, uh, a few days a month, he can actually work guys. 
And he's managed to work about 400 stations off the moon with just a single Yagi and uh, no elevation control. So uh, he's a, uh, an example of uh, amazing perseverance and patience, um, but he's been very successful. Uh, HS0ZIL down there in Thailand, that's a contact I'm really proud of. Um, the, uh, the, from here to Thailand is uh, sort of on the other side of the world. And uh, we only had a few minutes of overlap of uh, moon time. So this was right at my moon rise, at his moon set. And uh, we had about a 10 minute window. We were able to make the contact and I was real happy about that. KA6U, who uh, was, used to live in San Jose, now lives in Florida, started EME about five years ago and uh, uh, put together a portable station that he can deploy in about an hour. And he's done a whole lot of uh, grid roving and uh, he now is equipped for moon bounce on uh, all the bands from two meters through 1296. And uh, he can set it up pretty quickly. In fact, he's on a roving expedition now. Um, and uh, so he goes to rare grid squares and gets pileups of uh, uh, stations on moon bounce that need, uh, need the grids uh, or the states. I'm uh, looking forward to a couple of the states that I need that uh, he'll be going to. And you can see the antenna system that he uses. It's just set up on a little tripod and a mast. That's two cross-polarized 10-element Yaggies. Um, nothing really huge, a fairly simple rotator. Um, and uh, as I said, he can set it up pretty quickly and uh, be on the air, and he makes a lot of contacts. I've worked them from lots and lots of grids. So Moon Bounce, I think, is really the nerdiest and one of the coolest things, uh, at least that I've ever done in ham radio. Um, it's something that when you tell your friends and neighbors that you bounce your signal off the moon, they'll be impressed one way or another. They'll either be uh, impressed at uh, how, uh, how much of a genius you are and how brilliant you are to be able to do something like that, or they'll realize that you've totally gone off the deep end and you are completely insane. Um, you'll never look at the moon the same way again. You know, I'll be out driving around and I'll look out and I'll see them. Oh, look, it's a little after moonrise. That's kind of interesting. Uh, gee, I think this is a high declination pass. Uh, maybe I'll go home and work a little moon bounce. Um, and uh, it doesn't take a lot of money or equipment to get started. You probably have a radio you can use. Um, maybe you have an antenna you can use, but uh, if you ask around to some of the VHFers in your area, you might be able to scrounge stuff. Once you get started, it's hard to quit. Um, improving the moonbound station is a never ending task. I already have three or four things on my, uh, on my list of uh, upgrades. Um, I, I bought a new computer that's faster so I can uh, do a little bit of uh, wideband decoding. Um, I need to put a second preamp up on the tower so I can um, have uh, receive lines for both horizontal and vertical at the same time so I don't have to switch between them. Um, there's uh, lots of things to do to continue to improve it. So give it a shot. Um, maybe you'll get one of these some days. That's, uh, that's my specialized uh, QSL card that I use for, uh, for moon bounce. And um, um, I'd be happy to exchange cards with you sometime if uh, you get on and we're able to work each other. And that's the end of the talk. Well, that's, that's marvelous, Doug. I've got a question regarding that portable station. You indicated that the, that particular uh, amateur is using cross polarized uh, antennas. And at that point, is it horizontal? Is it vertical or, you know, it, it, with cross polarization like that, or is it both ways? It's um, well, it's uh, one or the other, the way he's got it set up and also the way I do it. Um, there is a, a system you can uh, use where if you have uh, uh, receive feed lines coming from both antennas, um, there are, there's a program called MAP65, which is uh, moon bounce adaptive polarization or something like that where the computer looks at the signal coming from both horizontal and vertical and actually figures out what polarization the signal is coming back at. Um, if, you're, if you're really clever, you can use that to figure out what uh, polarization you should transmit at to have the best success of uh, working the guy you're listening to. Um, but uh, I just switch between them. Um, I, uh, if, uh, if I'm listening to a guy, um, I'll call them with that polarization. And if that doesn't work, I'll call them on the next transmission with the other one. And one or the other will get through. Okay. Hey, Doug. Uh, yes, sir. This is Dan Moore here. 
Hey, I've um, got a couple of uh, circular polarized antennas I use on uh, my satellite stuff. Or is that any good for moon bombs? Yeah, you, you can, and there are guys who do it. Um, uh, by going to circular polarization, you're 3 dB weaker than you would be if you were on just horizontal when horizontal is the best. You're 3 dB weaker than you would be on vertical if vertical is the best. So um, if, you've got, uh, if you've got an amplifier, um, so you've got a little bit more signal, you can overcome that 3 dB, that's a good thing to do. So yeah, you can use circularly polarized antennas for, uh, for moon belt, sure. Okay, thanks. Doug, what, what frequencies on two meters are they using for, uh, for moon bounce, typically? 144.1, uh, 144, 144.100 uh, 144, to 144.150. All right. So there's a 50 kilohertz window in there that pretty much everybody uses. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's cool. I'm sure there's other questions. Well, perhaps not. My wallet is scared. <laughs> it always well, gets scared at these. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't really have to be. Um, you know, I, uh, I'm try I guess I should add up someday how much I spent when I first started on Moon Bounce. And again, I, I, I scrounged the Yagis for free. That was a good, a good start. I think I paid 200 bucks for the used rotator that, uh, a guy who had been doing satellites and wasn't doing it anymore. Um, and that rotator was perfectly adequate for the Yagis that I had. Um, I scrounged the Heliax from someone else. You know, if, if you're good at scrounging and going to flea markets, uh, uh, you, can, you can get a lot of this stuff pretty easily. Um, you know, you can pick up a suitable transceiver like a TS-2000. You know, they're, they're going out of fashion because everybody wants the fancy new ones. Uh, but I'll, I'll let you in on a secret. The TS-2000 has, uh, um, has a capability of listening outside the hand bands so you can hear that French radar beacon on it. Um, the IC-9700, the, ooh, got to have the fanciest new VHF radio, doesn't tune outside the two-meter band. So it's, it's already at a disadvantage for the moon bouncers. Um, but the good news is you can pick up a, a TS-2000 for you know just a few hundred bucks fairly cheap. Um, I'm trying to think of what the most expensive, I guess the most expensive thing is if you do decide you want to get into, uh, get into it seriously, um, two meter amplifiers capable of a lot of power are, can get expensive. Um, the solid state ones are very expensive, but um, you know, again, there, there are guys who did weak signal stuff for a while. They're not doing it so much anymore. Uh, they let their amplifiers go pretty cheap. So it doesn't have to be ridiculously expensive. And, you know, by now you've worked everything there is to work on HF. So sell your HF rig and get, uh, get, it, <laughs> get, on, uh, get on two meter move outs. Or sell your extra two meter HF rig. <laughs> oh. so, which or, of the extras? Yeah, we're, we're very lucky here because we have the, the uh, TRW swap meet. Uh, is it once a month or once every two months? Once uh, a month. Down to at the uh, TRW uh, uh, aerospace and, and uh, they have everything there. And we have, uh, we had a guest speaker maybe about six months ago that was talking to us about uh, oh, either satellite communication or I'm, I'm forgetting what, but it was, they were doing microwave and, and really high frequency stuff. And there's a whole group of people around with, you know, extra equipment that helps you out. You know, if you want to get started in it. Yep, absolutely. Just put the word out that you're looking, that you're thinking about doing it. And, uh, you know, you can probably swap something you, you're not using to, uh, to some VHF or for something that he's not using. Mm -hmm. That's how it works around here. Perfect. Yeah, yeah I, had, I had a quick, nowadays with the issues about RF radiation and that sort of thing, does that ha have a bearing on the power that you may be using for e EME? Well, you do, you do have to go through the arithmetic um, and uh, figure it out. Um, I, I did it with my array. Uh, my, uh, my effective radiated power is about a quarter million watts. Um, but uh, fortunately, it's uh, mostly pointed up in the air. Um, I, when I, uh, I bought this house uh, about four years ago um, when, we, when we downsized and uh, 
when I was thinking about uh, where I would put the moon bounce antenna, I was uh, very practical about it. Um, the, uh, when, the moon, when the antenna is pointed towards my house, um, if it's pointed straight at the house, straight at my room, um, then I would be over the RF exposure limit recommendations. On the other hand, when it's pointed in this direction, the moon is up as, at its highest, travis, uh, highest travel. So the moon is, uh, the antenna is pointed way over the house instead of at the house. Uh, so I'm, I'm out of the main lobe. Uh, pointed in other directions, my closest neighbor is about uh, three or 400 feet away and they're well underneath the uh, RF exposure limits. Yep, important to do your arithmetic, and do, we'll go through the worksheets and the, uh, you know, the, the the programs that are available online. So, yep, hang your stake in front of the thing, and it's done by the time you're <laughs> you're contacted. No. Well, you know that that's how they started uh, cooking with microwave ovens. They discovered that uh, you know a candy bar put in front of a radar would uh, start melting, and then they could pop popcorn and heat up their lunch. And, yep. Uh, created the whole industry of microwave ovens. Yeah, thank you, Amanda. <laughs> With what you're doing, are you able to do this year round? Do you have periods that are, I mean, I'm trying to figure out with what you're telling me as far as are there better times? I mean, other than times of the day, are there limitations? Well, uh, that's a good question. The uh, you, you, uh, you learn a lot more than you ever wanted to learn about orbital mechanics when you start doing moon bounce. For example, you learn that the moon rise is about 45 minutes or an hour later every day than it was the day before. Uh, you find out that the place where the moon comes up changes over the course of a month. Um, during uh, some parts of the month, it's at a, what's called a high declination pass, which means it's further north, which means the Northern hem Hemisphere can see the moon a lot longer. Um, and then at other times of the month, at the other, the other end of the month, the, uh, the moon is at a southerly declination, which means it's great for the guys in the southern hemisphere, and it only gets about 15 or 20 degrees above the horizon for those of us in the northern hemisphere. Um, so you get to learn all that kind of stuff. As far as uh, seasonal variations, not really. Um, you can do it year round. Uh, when I uh, have my station up in Maine, um, that house, I close that house for the winter. And it was driving me nuts because I would see the expeditions going to Africa and you know <laughs> rare places uh, during the winter. And my uh, my old house in New Hampshire was surrounded by very tall pine trees and was not, not suitable for for doing moon bounce. And the house in Maine was closed and it was too cold, um, so I couldn't get on for uh, uh, you know six months of the year, and that was kind of frustrating. So uh, when when I moved everything here to New Hampshire at the new house, um, I'm uh, a year round moon bouncer. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, it was kept in mind at the time you uh, purchased the home. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes, I'm on a hill with no neighbors in most directions. Uh, <laughs> here in Taxifornia, we have to worry about the Homeowners Association, which says we can't see an antenna outside for a lot of places. And most of us that have bought here made it a point of buying in a place with no HOA for the same reason. Yep. Yep. I, uh, I had a... Hi, Randy. Uh, Yep. Bye, Randy. Um, I did see a, uh, uh, or when we were looking at this house, it was new construction. And uh, we were talking to the contractor who was building this neighborhood where there are, um, I guess, nine houses on the street. And I said, you're, uh, you're not going to have one of these uh, homeowners association things for this neighborhood, are you? He said, oh, no, 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 we don't want anything like that. <laughs> no, <I mean> <laughs> then we'll keep talking yeah. <laughs> and we, we were the first house in the neighborhood and uh, um, uh, first ones to move in so the HF tower when actually both towers went up and uh, we moved in in August and uh, my goal was to be on all bands um, uh, before the uh, before the end of the year and I was I was uh, act, I was able to make contacts on 160 through 2 Oh, man. Fantastic. You're busy. Right, right here where we are in Santa Clarita, many of the communities and many of the uh, tracts of homes are governed by uh, CCNRs and, and homeowners associations. Right. So I'm lucky. I've got two towers at my house and they're small, but they're, I got two towers. But a lot of guys are having to work with wire antennas only on HF. And so it's it, it's tough. 
you, kudos to you. <laughs> there, there are some, uh, some of the remote ham radio stations actually have moon bounce capability. So, um, you know, if, you, if you're stuck in an HOA or apartment or some situation where you can't have uh, uh, any decent antennas, then the uh, remote is uh, uh, actually a viable option. Mm -hmm. Claude, you have a question. Go for it. Uh, yeah. With cl uh, this cloud cover, is cloud cover affecting the moon bounce? Uh, nope. Uh, the frequency nope. is low enough that it doesn't absorb it? Yep, it's not a problem. A uh, six meter moon bounce gets hurt a little bit by absorption um, when there's uh, high, high sunspot activity or high solar flux, that can be a problem. Um, but uh, on two meters and uh, the, the other bands, I guess maybe the microwave stuff gets affected by rain and clouds, but uh, um, uh, the only problem I have with bad weather is uh, I'm here in New Hampshire and we get snow and ice sometimes in the winter and rain. And uh, the, the antennas that I'm using um, are very sensitive to moisture on the elements. So if I get a lot of rain on them, I have to wait till they dry out and let the, uh, the SWR comes back to normal. Um, there was one expedition I was chasing and uh, I missed them because uh, we had an ice storm. The antenna was covered with ice and I, I couldn't hear them and I couldn't load, I, I couldn't transmit because the SWR was about a million to one. Um, so th those, those are weather related issues, but in general, no, uh, foliage is a problem. Um, on two meters, I can see the effect when the moon goes behind the trees in certain directions, um, that's a problem. Um, on the higher bands on uh, 432 and 1296, uh, trees and leaves are a huge, huge problem. Is the, uh, is the tracking software uh, similar to the satellite tracking or is it a completely different package? Um, I think it's similar. And the reason I'm sort of hesitating is because my tracking software is um, my fingers. Um, oh, okay. The, uh, the, uh, the WSJT software tells you where the moon is. Um, and... Uh, so you know where to point the antenna by just looking at the screen. You can automate it. I have not done that. That's one more thing that I'd have to keep track of and <laughs> fix it and uh, fix when it breaks and debug the software when I have a crash. And um, uh, plus, I like to have some operator involved, but I want to do something. So even with my antennas, which are fairly large, um, I only have to turn the antennas about every ten minutes or so. Oh, okay. So you can complete a. QSO uh, within at least uh, one position. Oh, oh, sure. Yeah. Yep. The moon doesn't move that fast okay. across the sky. Okay. Uh, someone had a question. Was that Jerry? Jerry. Yes. Uh, you answered. I was wondering how you aim your antenna when you have an overcast. And you just answer it with. <laughs> yeah. It, you know, <laughs> making sure the antenna is on the pointed at the moon is pretty important. Thank you. Yeah, it's pretty important to make sure the antenna is pointed at the moon. Uh, I've had oh, yeah. situations where guys uh, guys will say, gee, Doug, I, you know, I, I don't hear your signal. Uh, what seems to be the problem? You know, you're usually pretty strong, but I'm not seeing your signal at all. And I go outside and the rotator, the mass has slipped inside the rotator. <laughs> so, uh, but, uh, um, you know, the, you, you can, you can automate it or you can do it manually, but uh, um I, I'm happy to do it manually. Like I said, that gives me a little something to do. It gives me a little hands-on operating. Um, going totally automated is not where I want to be yet. Well, I'm one of those guys who lives in the uh, dreaded HOA. So uh, <laughs> the only way I get on HF is uh, <clears throat> is my uh, dipole in the attic. So <laughs> I, uh, I like to justify it saying that uh, it's not going hit, to get hit by lightning. So... <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I need to, it sounds like a lot of fun. I'd like to try and set up something, you know, uh, something I could put together, kind of like that, the gentleman you were showing who had the portable setup. Yep. So I, I think I'd like to try to do something like that if possible. Mm -hmm. So yep. I guess, uh, re realistically, I just need to build myself a nine element Yagi. So yeah, a nine <laughs> element Yagi and, uh, you know, a hundred watts or a couple hundred watts. If Scrounge, uh, scrounge one of these uh, brick amplifiers that some uh, VHF guy isn't using anymore. Um, that's good for you know a couple hundred or maybe three hundred watts. What uh, as as much power as you can muster. Uh, mo power, mo better. All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of uh, go against the grain, Doug, because I, I do have in my side yard, I have an 11 element uh, Kushcraft two meter Yagi, but I'm not going to give it away. <laughs> uh, I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll resurrect it. <laughs> you're going to have to get your moon bounce station set up here and uh, uh, get I'll your wallet to, out. I have to get another mass or another tower. <laughs> another tower. <laughs> well, that, I mean, it, it sounds to me like we've got the makings of a multi op group here. Joseph can uh, uh, <laughs> grab his radio and bring it over to uh, Patrick's house, hook it up to an antenna, scrounge mm -hmm. a tripod somewhere, or build yeah. something. It doesn't have to be fancy. You get a bunch of two by fours and you know, prop it up uh, a few feet off the ground and uh, start uh, tuning towards the moon. Yeah, and, and and if there's no Cusos, uh, you know, in the in the future, we, we just fall in the pool. <laughs> there you go. You bet. Anybody Any else? Last questions? Yeah. Anybody else? Well, I guess not. Doug, thank you very much. I know you're. It's quite late for you. Add three hours to to our time, and, and uh, so it's. Uh, you're watching the 11 o'clock news, I'm sure. <laughs> yep. Doug, thank At you very, very much for, for making the making the trip out with us. What a remark! Sure. What a remarkable presentation you've given us. And I had to comment before uh, the meeting. You're the only guest speaker we've ever had on Zoom that forwarded the PowerPoint presentation just in case there were some technical difficulties on your end. So that was very thoughtful. <laughs> Well, uh, having blown a few, uh, I, I, I always try to have a backup. You know, that that, that also, I, I guess that's sort of a habit that carries over to moon bounce. I've got uh, several spare preamps, a spare radio. Mm -hmm. I just got a spare, a spare amplifier that uh, I scrounged from somebody. So spares are good. But anyway, great. I'm glad, glad you guys enjoyed it. Thanks for inviting me to give the talk. Thank and you. Uh, see you guys on the air sometime. Doug, appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Doug. Thank you, right. Thanks. Appreciate it. I got to earn one of those QSL cards one of these days. <laughs> Absolutely. I'd like one as well. I appreciate it.